The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In both the Old Testament and Gospel lessons today, we have two of the harder to understand pericopes or, or readings, texts, and scripture. What does it mean that Jacob wrestles with God and he prevails over God? Why wouldn't Jesus listen to the Canaanite woman when we obviously know he didn't come just for the lost sheep of Israel? And he goes so far as to call her a dog. I mean, what exactly is going on here? Let us carefully uncover this mystery by starting with the Old Testament, and that will actually make the New Testament, the gospel lesson, make sense. Regarding Genesis chapter 32, verse 24, Martin Luther wrote, This passage is regarded by all, among, by all as among the most obscure passages of the whole Old Testament. Or is this strange? Because it deals with that sublime temptation in which the patriarch Jacob had a fight not with flesh and blood or with the devil, but against God himself. And then after going down a whole bunch of tangents as he's want to do. Finally, a few pages later, Luther gets to the heart of the matter. But our opinion is this, that the wrestler is the Lord of glory, God himself or God's son, who was to become incarnate and who appeared and spoke to the fathers. For God in his boundless goodness dealt very familiar, familiarly with his chosen patriarch Jacob and disciplined him as though playing with him in a kindly manner. But this playing means infinite grief in the greatest anguish of heart. In reality, however, it is a game, as the outcome shows when Jacob comes to Peniel. Then it will be manifest that they were pure signs of most familiar love. So God plays with him to discipline and strengthen his faith, just as a godly parent takes from his son an apple with which the boy is delighted, not that he should flee from his father or turn away from him, but that he should rather be incited to embrace his father all the more and beseech him, saying, My father, give me back what you have taken away. And the father, delighted with his test in the son, when he recovers the apple, loves his father more ardently on seeing that such love and child's play gives pleasure to the father. God was testing Jacob. Now, to Jacob, it seemed very serious. He was coming back from his father-in-law, where there was some dispute about sheep and that sort. And he was coming to meet his brother, his brother who even Jacob himself thought he had wronged by, quote-unquote, stealing the birthright. Now that's a sermon for a whole another story. Suffice it to say, God doesn't work in our ways. The firstborn isn't necessarily always the one that carries on the promise. But God is very clear that Jacob was supposed to be the promised one. So Jacob had fleed his brother, and now he's coming back. He'd sent all his possessions, divided them in two camps. He'd put his wives away from himself. And there the Lord came to him that night. Now Jacob can be interpreted to mean as liar. He who grasps the heel. But God renames him. God renames him Israel. He who is striven with God and men and yet prevailed. It finally starts to be clicking to Jacob, and what our pericope doesn't cover is basically Jacob's confession. But it does cover him begging a blessing, knowing that his own power is not enough, his own strength is not enough. That he's jumping from the frying pan to what feels to him like the fire.
But we also know, as scripture tells us, when we understand that this is testing, that this isn't that uncommon. I'm not saying that you wrestle with strange men in your backyard or your front yard. I really hope you don't, by the way, especially in a pandemic. But that testing or discipline is a show of love from God. And in this sense, Proverbs 3.12 declares, Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Hebrews 12, And your struggle against sin you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens the one, everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. What children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Jacob was being tested by God, and so was the Canaanite woman. Here is a foreigner who is looking to the Messiah. Here is a foreigner who is asking for mercy from what everybody believes is supposed to be the leader of the Jewish people. And she says, my daughter is afflicted by a demon, and he responds, not my problem. I'm only here for the Israelites. I'm going to take food from the master's table and throw it away. She said, yeah, but even the crumbs that fall, the dogs eat. It reminds me the parable of the mustard seed, her faith that moves mountains. And seeing her faith, seeing that she's holding up God's promise to God's Messiah, that he came not just for a few, but he came for all. Let it be done for you. And the demon is kicked out of her daughter at that very moment. We go through testing. We go through times of trial. And the question is, is what do you do when that happens? Do you fall away? Do you get mad? Do you get angry? You're driving down, let's take something completely innocuous. You're driving down the road and you're hitting every single red light and you're already late. Are you going, come on, God, help me out here? What about the more serious things in life? Finances health, loved ones. Testing can be short or it can be long. But what's the point of it? The point of it is to focus us more on God, more on the cross. To know that this trial is actually for our benefit. That the scrap given to us from the master's table can give us what this world cannot. The world cannot understand why we would desire what appears to be a beggar's meal over the feast it would offer if we would just renounce our faith. It says, why would you pick poverty over lying and stealing? 
For you won't bend to what is wrong, then you will be persecuted. Hatred, because we witness to the truth instead of loving what is false. It doesn't understand why we are contented instead of covetousness. It says, why would you desire so measly a meal as a crumb falling from some table when you can have rest and relaxation in this world? And it's because that little crumb that comes from the master's table, that wafer, that sip of wine, that word from the pastor, gives what the world cannot. It gives life and salvation. It stays the wrath of God. The meals of this world cannot stay death forever. The meal of God, the morsel of the of the foretaste of the feast to come gives life everlasting. It reaches into the grave and snatches you out of the grasp and grip of death, restoring you to the truly living. And when you discipline your child, did you did it because you hated your child? Because you loved your child? Or a student? Or a niece or a nephew? Did you teach them right from wrong because you wanted what was bad and wrong for them? Or did you teach them right from wrong hoping for the best for them? God wants what is best for us. He gives us the Ten Commandments for that very reason. Jesus died on the cross for that very reason reason. And to reiterate once again, is it easy when we're tested? No, it's not. No, but we're reminded about how much the Lord of hosts, the God of the universe, cares for little old you and me. So much that he would take that time, he would take that effort, to teach us the better way. In Christ's name, amen.